Neuro-Ophthalmology at Weill Cornell Medical College in New York Presbyterian Hospital, Associate Professor in Ophthalmology within the Department of Ophthalmology and Neurology, and a Robert and Helen Appel Scholar. Dr. Dinkin specializes in disease of the visual nervous system and optic nerve and treats patients with vision loss, double vision, and nystagmus. After completing his undergraduate studies at Harvard University in Boston, uh, he attended Weill Cornell Medical College and completed his neurology residency at New York Presbyterian Hospital, where he was chief resident. Returning to Boston, he received his fellowship training in neuro-ophthalmology at the Mass Eye and Ear Hospital at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Dinkins' research interest includes the use of optic coherence tomography, OCT, to detect retrograde transsynaptic degeneration of the retinal ganglion cell after post geniculate injury, and is the co investigator of a collaborative trial at Weill Cornell to treat medical refractory IIH, or idiopathic intracranial hypertension, with stenting of the transverse sinus stenosis. His papers on both subjects have been awarded the J. Lawton Smith Award by North American Neuro-Ophthalmology Society. He has also made several contributions regarding the neuro-ophthalmic complications of COVID-19. Dr. Dinkin is a passionate teacher, and his efforts has earned him Teacher of the Year awards from both ophthalmology and neurology departments at Weill Cornell. He enjoys teaching, directing courses for the American Academy of Neurology. He's an associate editor for the Journal of Neuro-Ophthalmology, an editor at Practical Neurology, and has served as a guest editor for Neurology's Continuum and for Frontiers in Neurology. He also enjoys, sorry, uh, enjoys serving as peer review for multiple ophthalmic and neurological journals. As director of the Weill Cornell Neuro-Ophthalmology Ophthalmology Fellowship, which he founded 10 years ago. He's thrilled to see former fellows rise to become leaders in the field. In his spare time, he enjoys writing musicals, but his greatest passion is for his family, which includes his wife, Julie, and three children, Max, Benjamin, and Sophia. Okay, uh, I'm gonna share my screen here. And uh, Dr. Feinberg, thank you so much for that incredibly generous uh, introduction. Uh, the, uh, the truest thing you said there was that I enjoy seeing former fellows uh, fly and spread their wings. And I'm so enjoying seeing you flourish uh, as you are now a, a full-fledged neuro-ophthalmologist and uh, so delighted to see you here at, uh, at the Swedish Neuroscience Institute. And I wanna thank uh, Dr. Elliot uh, and Dr. Feinberg for having me, uh, uh, where you have such a wonderful uh, tradition, not only of neurology, but of neuro-ophthalmology. Um, and so uh, when Eve asked me to speak today, she asked me to speak about uh, venous denting for idiopathic intracranial hypertension uh, because uh, it's now performed uh, here at, uh, at Swedish. And uh, so this might be relevant uh, for uh, neurologists uh, who take care of uh, patients with IH and are looking for uh, another tool in the toolbox to treat patients who are refractory to, uh, to medical treatment. Okay, so um, let me just click on this here. Let's see. Okay, wonderful. Uh, financial disclosure, just that I consulted for Serenity Medical a few years back, uh, but no longer. And uh, of course, I'll be talking about an off-label treatment for idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which is venous stenting. I always like to start with a case that was really um, kind of instrumental for me uh, developing an interest in, in venous uh, hemodynamics um, and um, uh, CSF uh, pressure dynamics. Uh, and I saw this all the way back as a medical student, actually. Um, we were sent uh, a 24 year old thin man who was sent for idiopathic intracranial hypertension, otherwise known as pseudotumor cerebri. Uh, he really had not much medical history, apparently, but it had developed severe positional headache, meaning worse when lying flat, and was found to have grade four papilledema. We'll go over the grades in a minute, but you can see here these disc borders are not flat. They're not clear. He had enlarged blind spots on his visual fields up above. For those who don't look at visual fields every day, this is from the perspective of the patient. 
And so the one on the left here um, is the left eye, uh, the one on the right is the right eye, and the dark gray blob is the normal physiological blind spot, which is on the temporal side of vision in each eye. But you can see the one in the left eye is a little bit enlarged. It should be like one pixel. It's more like two, two and a half pixels there. And that's because of the papilledema. But he also had abducens palsies. So he had double vision on the horizontal plane from that, which also, of course, could be a symptom of high intracranial pressure. So an MRI was performed at an outside hospital, and it just showed a little subfrontal meningioma, but nothing else. And a lumbar puncture was performed, which showed normal contents. There was no meningitis of any kind, but the opening pressure was quite elevated at 39 centimeters of water. And um, he was started on acetazolamide uh, with really not much improvement uh, for a few weeks. And so a ventricular peritoneal shunt was recommended for him. And he was sent to our uh, neuro-ophthalmologist at the time when I was a student who was a wonderful mentor of mine named uh, Jackie Winterkorn uh, at uh, Cornell. And uh, she did something that uh, I really hadn't been done yet, which is she took a deeper history um, and found out that for this patient one month prior to all of this, he had undergone a resection of just a small branchial cleft cyst in his neck, not a major surgery and not something he thought to tell anyone about. He didn't think it could be possibly related to what was going on in his head. But as we look back at the op report, it was clear that the surgeon who took out the cyst uh, had also sacrificed the right internal jugular vein. Apparently, it's not so bad often to sacrifice one internal jugular vein uh, if there's a second one. But in this case, that right internal jugular vein and the right transverse sinus that drained into it were the dominant veins. And the left side was non-dominant, uh, almost atretic. And so in so doing, uh, the main drainage uh, conduit for the venous sinuses had been removed. And uh, as we saw when we performed a follow-up MRI at our institution with MRV, uh, this had led to stasis, venous stasis, which had secondarily led to venous sinus thrombosis and even more uh, compromise to venous drainage. So you can see here uh, in panel C, this was a gradient echo, uh, which shows blood products. This dark area in panel C is the, a large venous sinus thrombosis. You can see in panel A on the MRV at blocking uh, the uh, signal of CSF flow. Uh, on panel D, you can see how small the left remaining side was. Um, and then by panel F was an MRV performed later, uh, where you can see contrast uh, in the veins after a ligation of the internal jugular vein was performed to reestablish uh, the internal jugular drainage on the right side. Um, and once that was done, all of the symptoms went away and the papilledema resolved. So this was an early lesson to me, just as a student, how important the venous system was for uh, CSF drainage. Um, and a reminder that venous disease can mimic idiopathic intracranial hypertension. In fact, venous occlusion from many etiologies can cause papilledema, as you know, venous sinus thrombosis, as we just saw, or sacrificing of the internal jugular vein, or venous compression by a dural tumor, such as a meningioma, uh, or um, you can see it from paragangliomas near the internal jugular vein as well. Uh, I've seen two cases of that um, that were originally thought to be IIH. Let's go to a second case that was uh, uh, that uh, I'd like to share with you. This is more recent from a few years ago of a 26-year-old uh, woman, a woman with uh, elevated uh, body mass index who presented with positional headaches, pulsatile tinnitus, like a whooshing sound here in her own pulse, dizziness, and transient visual, visual obscurations. Every time she stood up, her vision would go dark. And uh, so uh, we looked in the back of her eyes, and as you can see here, we have grade four papilledema. Grade four means that vessels, not just at the border, which would be grade three, but on the disc itself are obscured, and that makes it grade four. So for example, on the left eye, OS, all the way to the left of the screen, you can see the veins are still visible, but we don't really see the arterials on that disc and it's grade four. And you can see a hemorrhage uh, on the northern part of the disc and you can see 360 uh, puffy kind of elevation and blurring of the disc margin and more hemorrhage down below as well. 
when one scans the disc with optical coherence tomography, which we'll talk about a little more later, think of that as an ultrasound using light of the disc, we see uh, the elevation as we look at it from the side, and we see that it, the average thickness of the retinal nerve fiber layer, which is the nerve uh, fibers that are streaming along the retina to form the optic nerve, the thickness is 404 microns. Normal would be 100 or less in an adult, so about four times its normal thickness. And then finally, as we go to the visual field in the left eye, we see a very dense and large blind spot on the temporal side of the left visual field and an arcuate scotoma, like an arc uh, above and below, um, and nasal loss, a dark area towards the nasal side. And we see similar visual field loss on the right. For those who don't look at fields all the time, um, there's a typo on the left, something's blocking it, but we'll look at the right visual field where a normal uh, mean deviation should be zero decibels, meaning it's deviating from a normal visual field to zero. Um, but in this case, it's minus 10.21 decibels. So compared to an average uh, patient uh, age matched, uh, this patient was minus 10.21 decibels worse. Um, okay, so um, you can now see that an MR, uh, V was performed on top, and you can see stenosis or narrowing of the venous drainage, not only on the right side, uh, but also on the left side, quite narrowed veins where it really decreases to like a little straw there uh, on both sides. Um, a lumbar puncture was performed, um, and the opening pressure was 33 centimeters of water, elevated, and normal contents. Um, okay, and uh, so we uh, proceeded to treat this patient with four weeks of acetazolamide, increasing up to 1,500 uh, twice a day, 3,000 a day, uh, not really tolerating it uh, anymore, getting stomach problems, tingling in the hands, would not allow us to increase it anymore. Um, but the papilledema, the visual fields, the headaches, none of it was improved. And in fact, the visual fields were worsening. Um, the question is what to do next. Um, and um, that's what the focus of the rest of the talk will be on. Well, of course, everyone knows that you can perform procedures for those who are medically uh, refractory uh, in IIH. Um, one really uh, tried and true treatment is an optic nerve sheath fenestration. Um, and so in one uh, meta-analysis by Satie et al., 18% of the patients had optic nerve sheath fenestration performed. And relatively speaking, it's a relatively safe procedure. Uh, major complications in that review were uh, uh, basically misalignment of the eye, esotropia, exotropia, retrobulbar hemorrhage, um, uh, orbital hematoma, um, uh, orbital cellulitis, um, and then minor ones. Diplopia was considered minor, a tonic pupil, uh, cyst formations, uh, hemorrhages on the disc. Uh, those were more common. But certainly the, the most important complication that can rarely happen is vision loss from optic nerve sheath fenestration. I've seen it twice in my career, so it's not very common. But when it does happen, it's obviously uh, tragic because it usually the vision does not come back because usually it's from an, uh, an orbital hematoma uh, the, that occurs, unfortunately, during the surgery. Um, mortality from it really doesn't occur. I mean, other, other than could potentially happen from uh, anesthesia. Um, and uh, the second tried and true uh, surgical intervention, of course, is diverting the cerebral spinal fluid uh, with a shunt, which can, of course, be ventriculo or lumbar. Um, and um, in this review, major complications were uh, fairly common at 7.6%, uh, shunt infection being uh, up there, tonsil herniation from overshunting, some dural hematomas, and fistulas. And anyone who's been in neurology long enough has seen their share of complications from shunts. Uh, minor ones were even more common, uh, abdominal pain, valve dysfunction, shunt malposition, low pressure headaches, catheter migration, that was 32.9%. And mortality, uh, less than 1%, um, if you look at Smith's study, 0.3% or a little higher, um, not very common, but also not zero. Um, okay, and so keeping all that in mind, uh, let's zoom back for a minute. We'll get back to that case and see what we uh, eventually uh, did to try to help that patient. But let's just zoom out for those who don't think about IIH every day. What is IIH? What is idiopathic intracranial hypertension? And of course, it's intracranial hypertension, elevated pressure uh, in the CSF space in the uh, brain without a mass lesion, without meningitis, without a thrombosis. 
typically occurring in women with elevated body uh, mass index uh, who are of childbearing age. Um, and uh, as a rule, you shouldn't have hydrocephalus in the MRI because it's not a problem with CSF drainage in the brain. You're, you know, if you have something blocking CSF drainage, that's not IIH. That's IIH, but it's not idiopathic. Um, and again, the lumbar puncture should show normal contents with high ICP. And the standard treatments medical is medical treatment for most of our patients. Acetazolamide, topiramate has been shown to work fairly well. And of course, weight loss. Weight loss is the cornerstone of uh, future uh, resolution of IH. And so as when I start someone medicine, I also counsel them about weight loss, send them to a uh, nutrition uh, uh, or dietitian, uh, talk to them about exercise and the importance of that weight loss, because that will help uh, get rid of this disease and get them off a medicine. Um, it was earlier called, of course, pseudotumor cerebri, since there's no tumor, but patients hate the word pseudotumor. They think they've got some kind of tumor. That was changed to benign intracranial hypertension, which is good, benign, there's no cancer, but that left the impression it was such a benign disease that didn't need to be treated. And of course, people can go blind from this disease. So eventually, we uh, basically had a, a term that was more honest, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Not very easy to say to the patient, but I always explain this means that doctors are idiots, idiopathic. We don't really know why it happens. And although I will concentrate on the venous underpinnings of this disease today, the truth is it remains idiopathic. We don't understand fully why it occurs. We do know that it's occurring more and more frequently as the years go by, uh, certainly in the United States, and that has to do most likely with the increasing obesity pan, uh, epidemic. Um, you can see obesity trends here from the CDC from 1991 to 03, and then in 2017, um, in the red uh, areas here, 30 to 34 uh, percent of the population uh, considered obese. So um, as uh, obesity increases, this the rate of this disease increases. Okay, um, presentation, headaches, of course, worse in the morning after lying flat, positional worse lying down. Uh, double vision from abducens palsies. The abducens nerve gets stretched um, because it's a kind of vertical nerve that travels up from the pons up to Durrell's canal um, and has to climb up the clivus. Uh, neck and back pain, often uh, not talked about in this disease, but certainly occurs. The pulsatile whooshing, this hearing their pulse, appears to be due to the venous stenosis that is seen in this disease because um, when it's treated with stenting, that goes away in almost everyone immediately. And so they're hearing their pulse as this fluid, as the venous of blood is traveling through a narrowed space. And then of course, papilledema. The optic nerve swells, causing blurry vision, field defects that are permanent in 25% of patients, according to a Kathleen Degree study from 03, and transient visual obscurations as people stand up, the blood pressure drops, and it's not enough to perfuse this swollen optic nerve for a second until there's uh, compensation and people literally lose their vision for a moment or two. And you can see here papilledema at the bottom. You can see normal discs above if you don't look at optic nerves every day, but down below we see swollen discs and you can see these retinal striae around the disc, these wrinkles as the force is pushing the nerves forward, missing blood vessels. We can look more here on the left and see the grading of papilledema won't go through that in detail right now, but the bottom line is at grade three, you get vessel obscuration at the borders, grade four, even on the disc, and at grade five, no vessel seen at all. That when you see grade five, you should really think about a surgical intervention, even if it's not clear they're losing vision yet, because they often will progress to that. But interestingly, in early in papilledema, you get little visual acuity loss, little color vision loss. You really start out with that enlarged blind spot from the enlarged optic nerves. And eventually they'll get infranasal defects as their first type of visual field loss, which I show you in the bottom right here, uh, where that's the most prominent loss other than the enlarged blind spots. Um, but if the papilledema is untreated or if it starts out really bad, uh, rarely fulminant papilledema, you can get more serious vision loss, even losing acuity and color and even blindness can ensue. So uh, it was, described this disease in the 1800s by Quinky, but one of the um, earliest descriptions in the 1900s uh, was intracranial pressure without brain tumor by uh, Walter Dandy. And Dandy tried to sort of 
figure out, well, why is it happening in these patients who don't have a tumor or don't have meningitis? And he said, and I think this is true, we may well be dealing with a condition that has more than one underlying anatomic or etiologic basis. And then went on to describe some theories, but included in his theories, variations in the intracranial vascular bed, probably by vasomotor control as a theoretical cause of the elevated pressure. So early on, 1937, you already have a theory that blood vessels are playing a role. Um, uh, and I'm not sure if he meant veins or arteries, but um, certainly uh, this was thought about early on. And in 1985, Smith developed the modified Dandy criteria, um, where so now we finally had sort of firm criteria to diagnose this disease. Signs and symptoms of high ICP, no localizing signs other than sixth nerve palsy, but now we know that you can actually have a seventh nerve palsy and even hearing loss. So six, seven, and eight can all occur uh, from uh, IIH, uh, but when you see a seven or eight, you should think about masses, of course. And then the CSF we talked about, and the ventricles should be normal or small, okay? Normal neuroimaging. So if you see this, for example, with leptomeningeal enhancement, not IIH. But in fact, the idea that the imaging is normal is little bit of a misnomer because there are radiological findings of IH. For example, when you do orbital MRI, and I encourage you always to get orbital MRI in this disease, you'll see increased perineural CSF space around the optic nerve. It's accumulating there. You'll see a forward bowing, an anterior bowing of the posterior orbit, okay? And you'll see kinking of the nerve. Uh, as you see here, you'll see an empty cella often where the pituitary gland is pushed down by the elevated pressure. When you look at T1 post fat saturated orbital MRI, you'll see disc enhancement there uh, and there. You see it's a little bright. And another one that not everyone's familiar with is enlargement of Meckel's caves, medial to the temporal lobes. CSF is uh, sort of uh, accumulating there. It's one of the, again, a compensatory uh, mechanism to try to handle the extra CSF. You might see inferior tonsillar herniation mimicking a Chiari malformation below the form and magnum. Um, in some cases of IIH, and of course, venous sinus stenosis, as we've been talking about. And I don't show it here, but you can see increased arachnoid granulations, and you can even see encephaloceles. Um, so herniations of the brain through um, uh, little um, defects in the meninges as a way to try to compensate for the high pressure. What is the pathogenesis of this disease? We don't really know, but People uh, theorize that it's either from too much CSF production or not enough drainage. Either way, you're going to get increased ICP. And there's been some studies showing that differences in retinal binding protein and higher levels of free uh, cerebral spinal fluid retinol, which may cause arachnoid villi damage in patients with IH. Uh, decreasing the drainage, blocked nasal lymphatics, microthrombosis is theoretically playing a role, sex hormones, uh, increased adipose tissue uh, may affect sex hormone levels, may affect leptin levels, all leading to increased intracranial pressure. But today we will just focus on the upper right corner of this chart, venous sinus stenosis. Mimickers of IIH, there are many out there. Sometimes they can actually, patients can fulfill the criteria uh, the, the modified Dandy criteria, but still when you look closely, they're not IIH. This was a case in the bottom right. It was felt to be IIH, but they came to me years later, actually, once they already had terrible field loss and optic atrophy, but it was a thin man. So I was really searching for a secondary cause. Finally, after a workup, we found here on this um, conventional angiogram that they actually had uh, a dural venous uh, AV fistula. And you can see here the superficial temporal artery, middle meningeal artery feeding into the dural sinuses. Late in the angiogram, we go right into the, uh, the venous sinuses earlier than you should. Um, and so uh, this uh, fistula was repaired, trying to prevent any further complications. Craniosynostosis in children can mimic IH, even not just in, in infants, but in five-year-olds, six-year-olds. I've seen children, uh, toddlers, where craniosynostosis was missed and they present as IIH, and it can be tough to, to detect the craniosynostosis unless you perform a 3D CAT scan like this one here, where you see missing uh, 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 sutures, the sagittal sutures just gone there. Spinal arachnoid cysts, another spinal disease. This was a case I had, again, a thin man. So that's the red flag. It's not going to be IIH. And every time he would bend forward, fluid would travel out of a cyst into his CSF space, 
causing paroxysmal elevated intracranial pressure and papal edema. Hypervitaminosis A, you always have to ask patients, are they taking a retinol? Are they taking um, uh, all transretinoic acid, something that could affect um, absorption of CSF? And of course, tetracyclines like doxycycline can um, cause elevated intracranial pressure. But what about the rest? What about actual IIH? What is um, the cause? Are they really truly idiopathic or can we try to understand why this is happening in these patients? Well, um, there's a lot of research on that question, some of which is focused more on uh, hormonal uh, etiologies. But today we'll look at the role of venous sinus stenosis um, and, of course, the role of venous stenting to treat these patients. Um, when uh, years ago we looked at our patients and found that 10 out of 17 consecutive IAH patients had stenosis um, at the junction of the transverse sinus, which I'm showing you here in the upper right panel, and the sigmoid sinus. You can just see that area it seems to be where the stenosis usually occurs. Um, best seen on contrast MRVs because in non-contrast, it may look like it's stenosis, but it may just be a flow-related uh, issue. So down in the bottom left, we have non-contrast, uh, just a flow uh, MRI, but up top we have uh, contrast where you can see that there's actually no contrast, almost no contrast in those areas. But it was FARB in 2003 that showed using a special kind of contrast MRV that was, that was timed um, that 90% of IH patients had this stenosis in one or both of the sinuses, and that when it was in one, it was in the dominant side. And this was only found in four out of 59, less than 10% of control patients. So it certainly seemed to be a very common finding in IH patients. Well, what does that mean? Is it playing a role? And by the way, often not really identified by neuroradiologists. Sometimes if there's no thrombosis, this is common enough, they don't mention it. So you want to look yourself. It was King in 1995 who actually pointed out venous hypertension in the sinus system in seven IH patients um, and not in control patients and actually measured a gradient across the venous system, which was a mean 13.3 in the IH patients. It was only 1.4 in the non-IH patients. So he was showing that not only was there a structural stenosis, but actually it was hemodynamically significant in these patients. It was causing a pressure gradient. Well, Higgins took this information and ran with it. And in 2003, he became the first uh, uh, scientist to actually uh, perform stenting. Um, and he performed it in 12 patients with IIH, um, all of whom had, who had papil uh, seven of whom had papilledema, and in five of them, the papilledema improved. But in this first study, two required thrombolytics because they developed thrombosis in the stent. Now that's a lot, two out of... Uh, uh, 12 patients to have uh, thrombosis. But back then, Higgins was not pre-treating them with aspirin and clopidogrel beforehand as we do now. Um, so now we see that much less often. And in fact, I've never seen instant thrombosis in any of my uh, patients. Um, okay. Um, and many studies then followed um, where uh, retrospective studies showing uh, that um, Stenting could reverse papilledema and help with symptoms, uh, like this one uh, by Fields and colleagues uh, in 2013. So let's just look a little deeper at the pathophysiology. My green dots here in this uh, primitive cartoon uh, that I made will represent CSF particles. Uh, and of course, AG is arachnoid granulations, and they're traveling through the arachnoid granulations into the superior sagittal sinus, um, and then transverse sinus, and then down into the internal jugular vein. And you can actually model the CSF flow through those granulations. You can model ICP as uh, outflow resistance times the formation rate of the spinal fluid plus the pressure in the uh, sagittal sinus. So that if the pressure goes up in the sinuses, your intracranial pressure is going to go up. Now, if you develop stenosis at that region, of course, it's like a traffic jam. You're going to have um, an up. Uh, um, you're going to have downstream, excuse me, uh, slowing of the CSF, and now it's traveling more slowly. ICP is going to increase, but the actual veins are sitting in the cranium as well and are susceptible to intracranial pressure. So that elevated ICP will cause even further stenosis. 
that further stenosis will cause more ICP. And you can see this vicious cycle, positive feedback loop occurring, high ICP, more stenosis, et cetera, until the um, compressibility of, this, of the sinus um, it will no longer allow it to get any more stenotic. Um, and then it reaches an equilibrium where the force back from its own um, structure will not allow any more stenosis. Uh, but eventually the ICP gets high enough, you get papilledema. Okay, so, but King himself said, well, that may be true that you're getting the stenosis, but he actually uh, showed that when he removed spinal fluid through lumbar puncture, the venous hypertension resolved. So he's saying that venous hypertension is not the cause of the CSF pressure. It's just a result. Well, but then Bono and colleagues showed that um, they actually normalized the CSF pressure and the stenosis persisted even after they performed lumbar puncture or gave acetazolamide. Well, but then Rohr demonstrated that in some patients, the stenosis reversed after CSF diversion procedures. So Rohr argued you should not perform stents on these patients because, you know, really the stenosis is just a result of the high ICP. So which is it? What am I telling you here? And the answer is that it's both. There are two kinds of stenosis. One on the right is intrinsic, where over time you get something forming in the venous sinus, like a swollen arachnoid granulation or trabecula or septae, uh, or even a uh, organized thrombus that is blocking the flow of venous blood, but is an anatomical uh, feature that cannot go away. So swollen arachnoid granulations may happen actually as a means to try to compensate for the CSF problems in IAH. And at first they may help by swelling, by holding more CSF, but eventually when they get swollen enough, like this granulation that is beautiful here on this uh, T1 post-coronal, they'll eventually block the sinus. And once they form, they often do not resolve. So they're there blocking for the long-term. So these are called intrinsic. And one can see the benefits if you've got an intrinsic item blocking the area of stenting and sort of getting rid of that anatomical blockage. But the second, and those look kind of like focal regions of stenosis, but the second kind is an extrinsic where there's a slow tapering of the sinus. And in those cases, it's compression by the high ICP, by brain parenchyma in the setting of high ICP. So here in Ahmed's landmark paper in 2011, uh, where they showed uh, over 50 patients uh, stented. They also show different kinds of stenosis here, extrinsic, where it kind of slowly tapers, then here a more focal arachnoid granulation or septal band. Okay, so some reverse, some do not. But again, the question is, does it make sense to try to stent both types? Well, here we've got that positive feedback loop here uh, I was describing in a cartoon where you see elevated CSF pressure, let's say because of weight gain or hormonal factors uh, or uh, vitamin levels, who knows, but for some reason you get a first original elevation in CSF pressure, causes venous sinus compression, extrinsic stenosis, venous outflow obstruction from that stenosis, venous hypertension, and then more CSF pressure. And it, the, the circle goes around a few times, okay? So, um, but you can also get intrinsic stenosis from all the things I was talking about, such as swollen arachnoid granulations, which by the way, may occur because of dysfunction of the glymphatic system, which of course is this special lymphatic system surrounded by glial cells, which surrounds the venous sinuses. And I've colored in yellow in this cartoon at the bottom right. Um, and again, these granulations may um, serve as compens compensatory mechanism for a dysfunctional glymphatic system to try to hold extra CSF, but eventually they swell into the sinus. And so intrinsic stenosis, you could imagine stenting that and stopping the venous outflow obstruction. But if you stent ex extrinsic stenosis, even though it's not the original cause, it also will stop this positive feedback loop. It may not get rid of the original cause of a little bit of high CSF pressure, but it will certainly get rid of that mechanism whereby it increased more, 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 and more. And therefore, uh, we and others have stented patients with extrinsic and well, as well and have found um, good results in those patients as well. 
You could model it here as Ahmed did and others have um, as a collapsible segment in a box, a sealed box. So this is the segment would be the venous sinus. And basically it's like a, what's called a starling resistor where the pressure on the inside and the pressure on the outside of the segment are called P in and P out. And P in minus P out will give you that pressure differential. You multiply that by the fluidity of the, um, of the blood in this case, and thus you get the flow, okay? So the flow through the vein is gonna be dependent on that pressure on the outside, which is ICP. Um, and then you will uh, get the segment to collapse. So it just shows you mathematically how you get this cycle. But if again, if you can put a stent in there, it's no longer a collapsible segment and this whole model falls apart. So we set out a number of years ago to look at this, uh, look at stenting from a prospective point of view, um, because at that time there really hadn't been uh, really any except for one contemporaneous prospective trials. And all of the retrospectives um, were, the patients were uh, looked at at different time points. Um, and there really wasn't a lot of visual field data in these patients at that time. Now we have a lot more uh, from many uh, authors. And there also wasn't a lot of data about what the spinal pressure was after stenting. So uh, we took patients who they had to be refractory to maximal medications or have fulminant IH from the beginning. They had to have a visual field loss with a mean deviation of minus six in one eye or both. And we set out to look at their pre and post fields. Uh, we obtained, went to the FDA and obtained FDA approval for using carotid stents for this uh, study. Um, and uh, set out to get safety data, feasibility data, post-dent lumbar puncture in everyone, visual fields pre and post in all, and to use optical coherence tomography. 13 patients entered the original trial. It was a small trial, this perspective, and 36 patients um, who did not fit exactly the trial for age reasons uh, uh, underwent or other reasons underwent stenting outside the trial. And I'll, um, we'll look at both groups. Um, inclusion criteria, Andy criteria had to be fulfilled, pressure of 24 or more, stenosis had to be 50% or more on MRV, and the gradient had to be eight millimeters of mercury, which has been the standard uh, for a long time now, although some groups have shown that even with smaller gradients, you can still get good results. And again, stenosis bilaterally or unilateral in the dominant sinus. Okay, and they had to have vision loss minus six decibels. Um, on the visual fields, because after all, that's what we're really trying to do with something interventional like this is prevent vision loss. That's the main disability in patients with IIH. You can see here an example, somebody with fulminant papilledema, grade five, severe visual field loss. If they came to me in the ER like this on day one, I wouldn't wait to try medical therapy. I would either get them to have a shunt or fenestration or a stent right away because you, you can't wait. They already have significant vision loss. Okay. Interestingly, you perform manometry uh, to support the idea they have a gradient under local anesthesia because uh, the anesthesia might affect, general anesthesia might affect the pressure a gradient. But then they go under general anesthesia because angioplasty of the vein will hurt. Um, and so now they're under general and stenting is performed. You can see on the right here, this is Dr. Athos Patsolitis, who's been my uh, partner in crime for many years uh, on this work, uh, performing a stenting in the transverse sinus. You can just see it's deployed there. Um, and pressure gradients are obtained uh, via transduction from a microcatheter. And also in many uh, groups, including ours, ultrasound will be performed to get a better sense of the uh, stenosis from the inside. And we'll pre-treat uh, five days beforehand with aspirin and clopidogrel to prevent thrombosis in the stent. And then they will remain on aspirin for, uh, in some groups, it's six months, some it's a year, and clopidogrel for a month. Um, okay. And you can see here on the left, there's stenosis, a focal stenosis before. It's gone on the right afterwards. And then here is a, an extrinsic one down below. It's gone on the right. The stents, the original ones were eight to 10 millimeters in diameter and 30 to 40 millimeters long. And then we'd follow them up at regular intervals. And for those who allowed us, which was the majority, a, a lumbar puncture three months later. Here you can see what a follow-up MRV looks like, pre-stent, 
uh, the stenosis. And then post stent, you can see how the stent looks on MRV. There's a black line for the stent itself, but you can still see this sort of gray contrast moving through and show that there's no instant stenosis here on this MRV. So you'd really need to use contrast. So how about that first patient that I started the talk with? We decided uh, to perform an, a venogram. You can see the gradient was 37 millimeters of mercury across that stenotic area on the right side. We discussed with her shunting, fenestration, and stenting in detail, and she opted to enter our original trial uh, since she was not getting better on medicines. And in that setting, you can see here the optic of papilledema went away completely. The field loss resolved completely. OCT shows her thicknesses went down to 102 and 96. All of her uh, symptoms resolved and her opening pressure was 18 um, afterwards. And her gradient went from that 37 down to a four and there's the stent in place. So this was one of our home runs. And of course I'm including it here as an anecdote because it's one of our best cases. Not every case uh, is this you know, beautiful and neat, uh, but it's a proof of principle that in some patients who are failing medicine, Stenting can really help. Let's go on. So now uh, let's look at our first 54 patients in our registry treated since 2012. Um, and uh, this was whether they were candidates of that original trial or not. Um, and uh, 50, uh, if 51 of the 54 were female. Uh, and you can see about a little bit more were extrinsic than intrinsic, but about 50-50%. Okay, and uh, we let's start with looking at the just objective, what was the opening pressure three months later? 45 patients uh, originally agreed to get a second spinal tap, five refused, but of those that refused, three had papilledema that resolved and uh, one had headaches that resolved. Um, so here we go, here's our 45 patients and you can see blue is pre-stent, red is post-stent and you can see in the vast majority um, that uh, there was a nice improvement pre to post. The mean beforehand was 36.3. The mean afterwards was 20.8. Um, there's a few exceptions. So patient number four, it was actually higher afterwards. We're going to look at that one in detail. We had to retreat them with a second stent and then they did better. Uh, the circle is off, should be to the right. Patient number 30 just didn't improve, but probably not a good candidate. Um, and then over to the right, um, Again, the circle is off here for some reason. Let me just move this. Uh, yeah, all the way patient 43, all, they were basically borderline high pressure to begin with, but on a lot of acetazolamide that they couldn't tolerate. By stenting them, it allowed them to get off the acetazolamide and improve their quality of life. So sometimes um, they don't have, their pressure is not that high to begin with, but it's dependent on a massive amount of medicine that they're not tolerating. And then here uh, was our study um, where we looked at 50 patients. And again, similar, uh, similar results uh, where the vast majority had significant improvement and the mean improved uh, significantly. What about symptoms? How did the patients actually do? Because uh, they don't really care about their opening pressure. Well, 100% had headaches, the, the 54, 80% pulse tinnitus. 30% uh, diplopia and a little over 40% transient visual obscuration. So headache resolved in 35% and improved in 53.7%. So uh, resolved in a lot, but did not resolve in the majority. And this is part for the course in most IH trials. And, point, and it points to the multifactorial contribution to headaches in IH patients, which include migraine and tension headaches. Pulse daltinus, however, resolved in 76.7%. Um, and improved in, in uh, 21%. There was just one patient where it was unchanged. We went back and then did a study where we looked at pulse daltinus with a, a pulse daltinus grading system in 29 patients. And you can see here, it went to zero, the grading system in all but one uh, patient. Um, so, and by the way, again, the pulse daltinus goes away pretty much immediately after stenting, pointing to stenosis's contribution to that symptom. Diplopia resolved in 70%. And improved in a further um, uh, six patients, uh, unchanged in none. Transient visual obscurations resolved in 74% and improved in the remainder. So what about visual outcome? Again, symptoms are important, but what about their vision? It'd be great to get rid of their symptoms, but if you do that and they've lost a lot of vision by the end, you have failed. So here we just look at our patients who had uh, 
one or more or, or two eyes with grade two papilledema or more at uh, the onset. And we looked at visual fields. And again, whoops, we look in visual fields at their mean deviation, a very important thing to look at, which summates how they did on the visual fields. And you can see here for the vast majority, the mean deviation got closer to zero, improved uh, afterwards. And the mean went from minus 10 to minus four. Zero would be a normal. Some of them were just some eyes, and this, each one of these uh, set of bars is an eye, of course, because uh, we looked at each eye. Some of them, like eye number eight, couldn't improve because that optic nerve already had atrophy. You might wonder, well, then why did we uh, place the stent? It was for the fellow eye that was still had papillinema. So one of these other bars improved, and that was the other eye for that patient. But sometimes you can't uh, get improvement in the visual field if they're already atrophic. Speaking of which, what happened to the frizzen grade, uh, the grading of their papilledema, the mean went from 2.3 down to 0 0.56. So some people still had grade one papilledema, but in every one, the papilledema improved. Now, ocular coherence tomography is a nice way to quantify papilledema. For those who don't use this every day in neurology, it uses uh, a low coherent light, like an ultrasound. And you can see here a beautiful view of the macula using OCT. But in neurology, we use it more to look at the nerve. Here's a line through the nerve, and you can see what the optic nerve looks like from the side, OCT of the disc up here, okay? And then down below, we're using the OCT in a circle around the optic nerve to measure the innermost layer of the retina, which is called the retinal nerve fiber layer. Those, that is a layer of 1.2 million fibers that are streaming along from all the ganglion cells in the retina to get to this little hole in the back of the eye, the lamina cabrosa, to form the optic nerve. And of course, in papilledema, that layer gets thickened, and you can use that as one way to quantify papilledema. So here is an output of OCT in the right eye and the left eye. The right eye, everything is normal in the superior temporal inferior nasal sectors. But here we see a red area down below inferiorly where it's 76, where that, uh, that optic nerve has some atrophy inferiorly. Here is a case of papilledema. It colors thickening as uh, white. So in the right optic nerve, you see edema, every sector is white. In the left, all sectors but the temporal are white. And these are quite thickened with uh, means that are quite elevated. So now let's look at our cohort OCT performed before and after in 43 eyes. And the mean went from 209, remember normal is about 100, to a post of 96.7. And you can see it really decreased in all those eyes where it was increased to begin with, uh, by typically by a significant amount. So it's a nice way to quantify the improvement in papilledema. Another way to look at papilledema is looking at the nerve from the side. The uh, Look at panels D, G, and K. D was originally in a patient. G, after medicine failed, it's still pushing forward. You can see the angle is kind of pushing upward. Um, that's the angle of, of Brooks membrane um, it, to the horizontal horizon. And then after stenting, you can see in K, now it's more flat and the thickening has gone away as well. Weight changes, you might think, well, maybe these patients just lost weight in our trial. They actually gained weight, uh, perhaps because even though we told them to lose weight, they figured they were getting the stent, uh, but they, this was not from weight loss. And I mentioned that I would focus in on a patient who needed retreatment. Well, it turns out that one of our patients did need retreatment uh, in that original group. You can see here the stent was placed after they presented with an opening pressure of 28 and their gradient was 14. So we placed the stent, post stent gradient was just two and the papilledema resolved, so success. But three months later, just before we were gonna do that three month lumbar puncture as we um, were always doing in our, in our original trial, papilledema recurred and all symptoms recurred. And you can see here, the stent is now uh, open but just next to the stent, there's a new area of severe stenosis. We call this stent adjacent stenosis. And that can happen sometimes. It's like, you know, you, you put your, your finger in the dam and you, you stop one leak and then another one pops. Well, here another stenotic area forms. And the gradient across that was 20 and her opening pressure was 29. So a second stent was placed next to it. And now their symptoms resolved again, papilledema resolved again, and the opening pressure went down back to 21. So sometimes you need to place a second stent. And this led Dr. Patsolaitis, who I worked with, to place two stents overlapping to cover a larger area. And that decreased um, the uh, rate of retreatment. And now uh, many are using longer stents. Um, okay, 
So I'm, I'm mindful of the time and we'll just go another five minutes so we have time for questions. Um, so retreatment in our group, seven out of 54 patients required retreatment at some point. And that can happen as soon as three months or in one case, as late as two years. Um, and uh, it occurred a little bit more frequently in the extrinsic stenosis group than the intrinsic. Um, and, um, but it, it worked in all cases where we placed a second stent, um, except for one who required a shunt after the second stent because they still had symptoms. So that was a real uh, failure. Uh, safety. In our uh, group, venous stenting was complete in all cases. There were two retroperitoneal hematomas related to placement uh, of the uh, catheter. Uh, there was one ruptured ovarian cyst, maybe just from being on uh, antiplatelet. And then a lot of patients had post stent headaches that lasted usually for about a week and responded to uh, corticosteroids orally. Uh, limitations. This was an uncontrolled study without direct comparison with alternative treatments. Nobody was blinded, physicians or patients. Placebo effect could have contributed to symptom improvement in the patients. And in some cases, improvement, even objectively, may reflect delayed effect of the medications that they were already on. And conclusions about safety need to be tempered by the fact that the uh, interventionalist I worked with was very experienced because this was his research. So he had performed a lot of stenting. And so in, uh, in looking at more studies, uh, the safety might not be as good as Dr. Pat's solitis. So I reviewed 50 studies and there's no time to go over that review right here. It's similar to what we found. Uh, and you can look through the slides uh, later if you wanted, but I will just jump to complications because that's important. And I think we can see that in 1,626 patients that I reviewed for this review, you can see um, that most complications occurred un uh, infrequently. Um, in Ahmed's study, two had suffered a subdural hematoma though, both made full recoveries. Um, and most importantly, um, I think what everyone would be most interested in is mortality. So that occurred in six patients out of 1,626 that I could find in the literature. So 0.37%. So rare, but not zero. And I think it's important to remind patients that mortality can occur. I always tell them death can occur with this procedure, even though it's not a surgery, it is a procedure where an inter we are intervening and death when it occurs can occur from a generally a, a guide wire uh, rupturing the venous sinus and a, and a massive hemorrhage or uh, thrombosis. Um, I'm gonna skip uh, a few, but here retreatment in the larger group in 8.9%. And you can try to predict who's gonna need retreatment. Um, so in our study, uh, we found uh, that it occurred uh, in a larger group um, and stent failure occurred in 13.9%. In Garner, in Garner's study, um, they tried to say, well, okay, uh, what uh, was going to predict that? And um, they found that, interestingly, a lower opening pressure post-stent uh, seemed to uh, predict the need for retreatment later. Uh, so when to consider stenting? You may have heard this whole talk and say, okay, well, who should I send for this? And really, it should be progressive, persistent vision loss from papilledema despite escalating medical treatments or fulminant papilledema. Uh, not every mountain needs to be climbed. Not everybody with papilledema and IH needs to have a stent, of course. Um, and I think it's important to be very cautious about stenting patients who don't have papilledema with vision loss to try to get rid of headaches because many of them will not improve because it's such a subjective finding. I have been proven wrong and I've seen patients who've been stented for their refractory headaches and do well, but you gotta warn them, you know, this may not be the solution. And again, it's an intervention with risks. Um, okay, I'm again aware that we only have six minutes left. So for the last minute before questions, I'll just point out that we and others have studied this in children. We looked at this in eight children and, um, uh, opening pressure normalized in seven out of eight of them, um, although one required repeat stenting and another required a shunt. Um, so tread carefully if you're going to perform it in children. There's not a lot about it. And then also there's a, a new burgeoning literature about CSF leaks in IH, that leaks may serve as a compensatory mechanism. But of course, if you then fix the leak, now you, that's great because now they don't have a danger of meningitis, but you now may have increased their risk for IIH. And indeed, Labrie and colleagues showed that by stenting these patients after you fix the leak, you decrease the chance of another leak and you decrease the chance of them developing IIH. Um, and I'll just end by saying there are many uh, ongoing trials comparing shunting to stenting around the world. 
um, that hopefully will give us some more scientific evidence of head-to-head -head prospective trials of stenting versus shunting. Uh, it's still in a way experimental. Um, we don't have head-to-head uh, -head prospective trials, uh, but I hope we will soon. And certainly I think we have enough data to at least offer to our patients as a tool in our uh, toolbox when they need a surgery. And I'd like to thank uh, many uh, collaborators over the years who have worked with me on all of this work. And I want, again, want to thank all of you, uh, Dr. Feinberg, Dr. Elliott, and all of you for having me today. It's a great pleasure, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Dinkin. That was a wonderful talk. Um, in these last few minutes, we do have some questions. Uh, the first question, uh, in a patient with Chiari malformation, how would you determine that the Chiari was not the cause of the increased pressure? Yeah, uh, really tough to do. And sometimes we're fooled by that. Generally, if it's more than five millimeters and it's officially a Chiari, it's usually a primary, uh, either a primary Chiari or it's from low intracranial pressure. In, in decreased intracranial pressure, as you know, it can go pretty sag a lot. From high ICP, it's usually three, four, maybe five millimeters. But it's, if it's really severe and blocking the form and magnum a lot, it's usually primary or low ICP and not high ICP. Secondly, you can see it improving uh, with uh, you know CSF diversion or uh, acetazolamide. You can see the inferior tonsil herniation go away. That's another clue that, of course, it was secondary. Uh, but it can be tough. Uh, and of course, if it worsens over time, it's usually not primary. It's either from low or high ICP if you see, you know, if you see it changing dynamically. Great question. Thank you. Uh, next question. What do we do if a patient of IIH develops a low pressure headache symptoms after CSS for diagnosis, I'm assuming lumbar puncture. And they go on to say predominantly unilateral IIH, dural AV fistula and IIH. Mm, yeah, um, if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, you know, what do we do when these patients with IH develop, uh, you know, uh, low pressure uh, afterwards? First, I'll just say, of course, you know, some develop just a, a transient low pressure syndrome from the lumbar puncture. We perform patches, of course, to help them, blood patches, and usually uh, that will, that or the tincture of time will help them. But it's true that some patients uh, are what I think of as cyclers, where they'll have high pressure, they'll develop a leak of some kind, the leak will lower their pressure. Uh, now they have CSF uh, intracranial hypotension, and then uh, it's low long enough that the leak will close, and then their background IH physio physiology will lead them to have high pressure again until the leak opens. And, and these patients will tell me, I can tell when I'm in a high pressure month or a low pressure month. And so for those patients, uh, one of the things that we've been doing is venous stenting those patients if they have stenosis and a gradient, uh, to try to treat an underlying linchpin in the uh, uh, pathophysiology. And then if the leak doesn't go away that way, you can then repair the leak knowing that they're probably not going to now get bad IH because you've treated an underlying cause. Um, so, or you can, you can uh, perform, uh, fix the leak first and then see how they do. And then if need be, you can uh, perform a stent or just start them on medicines. Um, so really, really good question. Uh, and it's it's tough, those ones that are cycling back and forth. Now, then you mentioned a dural AV fistula, and that's true too, that if they have a dural AV fistula, you have to be careful about performing a spinal tap. Uh, in the case I showed you in an outside hospital, because they didn't see they had a fistula and they thought they had IH, they performed lumbar puncture, large volume. And for whatever reason, that patient then did much worse afterwards. Sometimes a fast and significant drop in ICP in the setting of a dural AV fistula will worsen the uh, flow through the fistula and, uh, and maybe even lead to thrombosis and, and, just, and, and worsen their papilledema and their clinical scenario. So be careful about performing lumbar puncture in those who have thrombosis or fistulas. Great. And um, another question, when can you comfortably taper off Diamox after stent has been placed? There was a neuro-ophthalmologist here who had a 14-year-old obese male with stage 5 papilledema to receive while he was on 
uh, three to four grams of diamox. Now he has dysatrophy pallor, and this um, op the neuro ophthalmologist is gradually bringing diamox down. But could uh, they have come down earlier? When should we trust the stent to work? Yeah, a really good question. Um, although we waited three months to perform lumbar puncture uh, because they were on, you know, aspirin and, and clopidogrel, so we couldn't uh, perform the LP right afterwards, and we found excellent results for drop in CSF. Others, by uh, having in place uh, CSF pressure measurements, uh, you know, um, already uh, by putting in a lumbar drain, were able to show an immediate drop in CSF pressure. Uh, this was done by uh, Steve Newman, for example, where in one case it went from 70 down to you know 20 right then after the stent. So we think that in the majority of patients, the drop in pressure is going to be very quick. And therefore, logically, one could try to uh, taper uh, the acetazole line quickly. Um, in my cases, it totally depends on how bad the papilledema is and the visual field loss is. It's a patient with grade you know, two papilledema and they don't have much visual field loss. Um, and they seem to be doing better symptomatically, I'll just stop it, um, you know, or taper it over a week and watch them carefully. All these patients, I'm watching them carefully. If it's somebody who's had a lot of vision loss, I'm so worried about any further vision loss that um, I, I taper it over the first uh, two to three months um, and, and just watch them carefully because I'm watching them frequently in, the, in those first few months. Um, now, of course, if they already have atrophy and there's no further papilledema, they probably can't mount papilledema if it's really bad atrophy and I'm not that worried about vision loss. So I might actually at that point uh, taper them more quickly. But I think your question implies the answer already. You know, if it's a case like that where they've had a lot of vision loss, um, you know, caution is, is the right way because you can't undo the vision loss once it happens. And what's an extra month or two of acetazolamide, you know, if they're tolerating it okay. Um, but certainly, you know, within those first few months, I think it's generally okay. Just watch them. Rarely have we needed to restart it. <laughs> there is a final question, but this could be a lecture in itself. What is done in pregnant patients with IIH? Yeah, yeah, of course, a wonderful question. Um, I, I think it was uh, Julie uh, Filardo who years ago uh, performed a nice uh, retrospective study looking at acetazolamide safety in over 100 pregnant women with IIH. And, and in that study, uh, the rate of spontaneous uh, miscarriage, uh, the rate of fetal uh, abnormalities was no higher in the acetazolamide group uh, than, uh, the non than, uh, than those who were controls. Uh, and I talk about that with my pregnant patients. Generally, I'm still nervous about using acetazolamide in the first trimester as the organs are forming, but I feel very comfortable using it in the second and third trimester. So if possible, try to get them through the first uh, with, a, with a lumbar puncture or, uh, you know, if they don't have bad papilledema, just kind of, you know, wait until the, and usually it's not a problem because usually they present a little bit later in pregnancy uh, when it happens. Uh, if they already have it active, they usually don't get pregnant or they try not to if they already have very active IH. So that's a nice uh, fact to, to know about. But if they do, if they are failing, um, then um, uh, stenting would be really not a good option for so many reasons. But one, there's all the x-rays and the, you know, fluoroscopy, and then they've got to be on aspirin and clopidogrel, which isn't great for the pregnancy. So there um, you could perform, if they really were losing vision, um, a shunt would be a very reasonable, or fenestration would be a, a very reasonable thing to do. Uh, both would require some anesthesia, probably shunt for less time. So probably a shunt would be reasonable in those patients. Uh, and it kind of brings to another question of, you know, be very careful in your stenting patients, because once they're stented, if you fail, then they're on aspirin and clopidogrel for a month. And if you wanted to perform another surgery, you, it's hard to do that because they're on dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, I had one patient uh, over all the years, it was the one that was not a good candidate, really, I thought afterwards, who really just didn't respond at all. I've really only had one patient who just didn't respond to stenting and they had significant papilledema and they needed a shunt. But I waited uh, a few weeks uh, so we could at least stop the clopidogrel and just be on aspirin. And she made it through without any worsening of vision. And then we put in the shunt. So you just have to keep that in mind. Uh, but it, the bigger question about pregnancy is great. And there are a lot of uh, experts out there who, who have wonderful papers on this, including Debbie Friedman, Kathleen Degree, and others uh, on uh, pregnancy and IH. Okay. Thank you so much. I think that's all the 
time we have today. I just want to thank you personally, Dr. Dinkin, to setting time aside on your vacation to really educate us today. Yeah, it was a great pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for having me, and uh, hope to see you in person in the future.